my name is Christine Musser, and I'm here interviewing um, Denny Herzig, so I'll let him take it over. Yeah, my name is Denny Herzig. I, I came to Cumberland County in 1973. Uh, I originated from western Pennsylvania, actually in the city of Altoona, which is, uh, I grew up there with a large family of, you know, 14 children, and was married there and decided after about three years of working in the mining industry, which I had a, worked for a company that performed crushing coal. And that's basically that particular area. If you lived in that area, you had coal or steel or the railroad, Pennsylvania Railroad, uh, the Horseshoe Curve. And, and there's a lot of history in uh, Blair County. But in the early 70s, that was a time the economy was difficult. Uh, the coal industry was having a slowdown, and that's where my business was. They were all converting to gas. Seems like that's where we're going to today. But uh, my wife and I decided it was time to relocate, and we looked at a bunch of areas, and particularly uh, in eastern PA. We really wanted to go to Pittsburgh, but that was a difficult time for there because the steel industry was coming down. So we decided to move down here because we had relatives that lived in Mechanicsburg. And so... I decided to look for a job in this area, and one of the jobs I got, I became a policeman for Silver Spring Township. Uh, it was a time when the police department had started in 1969, and I came in 73. So the original individuals of the police department that were there, uh, they had already gone or left, and they were starting a new police department. Uh, Silver Spring Township at the time was a very small township. More or less, I could say it's a bedroom community to Harrisburg. Uh, at that time, I think that Silver Spring Township was in a state of, of flux. It, uh, it was trying to establish an identity in Cumberland County. It wasn't quite Carlisle. It wasn't quite Harrisburg. Uh, one of the things that was unique about it, it had a lot of different mailing addresses. One of them being Enola, uh, had addresses in Enola called Mounted Route Enola, Mechanicsburg, which is most part of it, and Carlisle, which was on the western side and on the southern portion uh, down near Trindle Road towards their Carlisle fishing game. At that time, all the traffic funneled on to the Carlisle Pike, so it was... <laughs> Kind of a difficult thing for a police officer because if you look at the traffic that's now in 81 which came later it just shows you what kind of traffic follows through silver spring township basically was a community of farms uh, a lot of farms a lot of people had farms uh, and they uh, the people here were just uh, typical farmers uh, that uh, probably grew up on their farm. Some of them didn't, but for the most part, the, uh, the farms were uh, run by people who had a lot of children, and, uh, and in the past, uh, they had uh, wanted to give their farms to their children. But um, as you see it today, Silver Spring Township, 80, Interstate 81 was a big change to the township. What it did was it took a lot of traffic off the Carlisle Pike, but it, and it put a lot of traffic on Interstate 81. It bypassed a lot of things, like in communities where there's the main road goes through town, and as soon as the major road is created, the town sort of dies off, and there's not the commerce or the, the people there. Well, that didn't happen in Silver Spring Township. Uh, one thing about Silver Spring Township in Cumberland County, it's been said to be the fastest growing township now in the whole United States uh, because of the, the people moving in or because of the close proximity to Harrisburg, the state capital. We have the Navy depots. We have the Carlisle Army War College close by. But uh, I think that it's starting to grow because Everything is being pushed from Harrisburg over. And so now Silver Spring Township is starting to become kind of the place to live, you know, with the Cumberland Valley School District there. So uh, that was one of the big things that I think has progressed pretty much to show that Silver Spring Township is kind of a, a place where people want to come to live. Mm -hmm. With our new developments, we have a lot of new developments going on. My days as a police officer started, I was 
23 years old. I was a young person. I had a, I didn't really have much of an interest in history. I, I was more or less trying to raise a family. Uh, I, you know, I had an engineering degree from Penn State, and so uh, I, I, going from that, from working in the coal mines to a police officer, the dangers were just different. So, <clears throat> but one of the things that the chief of police that I worked for, his name was John Toomey, and him and I spent a lot of time together. He was ex-military. He was uh, he he was in the Vietnam War, and uh, he was big on information and assistance. And I always talked to the chief. I said, "What do you mean information and assistance?" He said, "You have to talk to people. You have to talk to the people of the township to find out what they're who they are and what they're doing." One of the first jobs that I had with him was there was a man who had a farm, and he uh, was accidentally, uh, he died, and his widow lived in a farm just north of where the Cumberland Valley Votech is. And so the chief said, why don't you go out and talk to this lady, make sure she's okay. You know, just drive by, do a drive by at night. So I would do that, and I ended up talking to her, and uh, her name was Anna Swigger. And little did I know, her brother, was a, an individual named Walter Bayshore, who I got to know very well. Walter Bayshore was married to one of the Shawls. The Shawls had Shaw School in the Cumberland Valley, the Shaw area in Hampton Township. And he had a farm on Sample Bridge Road. Sample Bridge Road is one of the main arteries in Silver Spring Township. If you include Rich Valley, Silver Spring Road, uh, you know, uh, 114. Um, at that time, there was really not a lot there. 81 crossed his farm, but not at that time. And, and Walter and I would sit down and talk, and he was probably 70 at the time. Uh, and we would just discuss things. We, he would tell me about Clyde Shaw. He would tell me about the area. He would tell me about his farm and how he got it and, and what his projections were and who he knew. He knew Max Hemp real well. Walter Bayshore was one of the individuals who was on the school authority who started to Cumberland Valley High School. Years ago, people and children from the Cumberland Valley School District went to Mechanicsburg. It was a Mechanicsburg school. Mm -hmm. And dotted throughout Silver Spring Township were schoolhouses, which I live in one today, which is the Simmons Schoolhouse, mm -hmm. off the Simmons Run on Sample Bridge Road, right up from Walter Bayshore's. And so with that, he is one of the individuals that I talked to, and uh, there were many. And many of the people, that, the older people that I got, to, I just, it just sort of, I migrated to talking to the old people. Bill Stauffer, who had the Nature Center out on Locust Point Road, I talked to him and his wife many, many, many times. We discussed either, anything from bacon, beans, to, and he lived in an old house with a bunch of dogs. Jack Sullivan, who was the township solicitor, who lived in the Sample House on Sample Bridge Road. And Betty Sullivan was really the one that got me into talking about history. Back in the early 70s, uh, Betty called me and he, she said, I want you to consider becoming part of a grassroots organization called the Silver Spring Township Civic Association. I said, well, what are your plans, or what is, what are you gonna, what's your scope of that? She said, there is a farm located on the Carlisle Pike, the McCormick Farm, and she said, we want to preserve that farm. And I said, well, do we have other individuals that are interested? And at that point, then I met Bud Gaskin, I met John Moorfield and his wife. My wife was part of the Civic Association, and what we did, we banded together, contacted the Philadelphia Land Trust, who now has taken that farm, and it's gonna be preserved as a farm forever for one reason. Back in the early 1700s, Mr. McCormick's son was killed in a farming accident. And through his will, he said, that farm will be forever uh, a farm, and it should never be developed, or should never be anything but a farm. And so, uh, we contacted them. We have a big monument. If you would go on the Carlisle Pike, just west of Hoagstown on the north side, you'll see a big stone with a 
a marker and a uh, split rail fence around it. That was something that we accomplished on the Civic Association. And the farm right runs from Hoagstown all the way out to behind Bobby Ray Hall, which is now uh, uh, on Rich Valley Road. And so I know there's a big push for farming to be you know, preserved, and and that was one of the that was the first farm that was preserved. So we're way ahead of the game on that. And so a little help from the McCormicks, mm -hmm. but uh, you know Silver Spring Township, the Carlisle Pike was really a uh, thoroughfare, and it was like midway between Harrisburg and Carlisle. And so along that way, you will see a lot of houses, a, a lot of what they called uh, taverns and way stations and the Bell Tavern, which is uh, a big uh, house that sits on the westernmost part of Silver Spring Township, which has a, a history, as according to Bud Gaskin, almost everybody that was anybody stayed there, including George Washington. Now, George Washington apparently stayed in a lot of houses that he probably never did, but you know everybody thinks he did. So uh, that was one of the things that Bud was always big about. And, and he always said about the Carlisle Pike, uh, one time when I was with him, he says, you know, I found the Carlisle Pike. I says, but it's right in front of the house. He said, oh, no, no, I found the original Carlisle Pike, which is in an area where the car lots are now. And so, and Bud's still with us. He's 100 some years old. He'll be 101, but uh, um, him and I would sit for hours and hours and go through historic manuals that he had of Cumberland County, Franklin County, uh, marriages and and toward his later years I would listen to the same story three or four times but it was always an interest I you could see the twinkle in his eye when he talked about the history he lives in the David Hogue house which is in Hoagstown and he would talk about the Canaga house and the Bell Tavern he would talk about the Junkin house and I would like to talk about the Junkin house but let me I'll get through it but because the Junkin House is something that's pretty um, sentimental to me and, and what I'm trying to do. And where's the Junkin House located? The Junkin House is located on, uh, north of New Kingston uh, on um, Cumberland Drive. And it is, a, uh, it is an old house, a stone house built in the 1800s. And it's one of the people who have you know, started this area when this area was considered the frontier. When there was nobody here, uh, but uh, and Bud talked to me a lot about that, and uh, he talked about a lot of the houses in Hoagstown, a lot of the houses in New Kingston, and uh, I'm kind of uh, in my you know travels, you know, that uh, I'm a member of the, I have a committee with the Silver Spring Township, which is a conservation and preservation, which we we saw that, you know, that the township was going to be developed and we wanted to do it the right way and we found this uh, growing greener aspect out of Philadelphia of an individual that, you know, kind of eliminated the cookie cutter development. We knew the land was going to be developed and so uh, about seven or eight years ago I was asked to be on this committee and uh, we reviewed a comprehensive plan in Silver Spring Township, and we have a lot of learned individuals. We've been able to modify some of the ordinances that will make it an enhancement. We know development's coming uh, because, like I said, Silver Spring Township is considered one of the growing townships, and, and fastest growing townships. And there has to be a happy medium between residential and commercial, but mm -hmm. a lot of residents are being built on farms that I once knew. The Roger Hoke Farm is now a development. The Conrad Farm is being a development. I didn't like to see that, but, you know, there's some things have to be accepted. Mm -hmm. And so if we're going to do that, let's do it right and do it correctly. And so... With the growing greener aspect, we modified our ordinances. And now, if there is going to be a change, we'll look at these uh, developments. And we are a just a recommendation board. We don't make decisions. We'll look at the plans, and then we'll make our recommendations to the board of supervisors as to whether we think it's a good idea or not. I mean, we've turned, some, we've given them, said that we don't think so, and some we said, yeah, that looks fine. They uh, they adhere to what we would like to see. And, you know, development has a lot to do with 
density, housing densities, and and how many you know houses you can build, and we need to have green space. And one of the things that's really sensitive with the growing greener was protect the Cono de Gwinnett, and that's one of the things that we want to have the vegetation. One of the things we've decided was vegetation along the Cono de Gwinnett. Uh, since it's part of the Chesapeake Watershed Association, we got to keep a lot of the farmland. And I mean, we're a farming area, and you know, to keep some of the residue from the farms and, and have that so they're not uh, bleeding into the creek and causing a problem with the Susquehanna all on their way to Chesapeake Bay. So, and there's a lot of different uh, grassroots organizations like the Conda de Gwinnett uh, Watershed Association, the people that I know. Uh, pretty much, uh, I, I, other than the people that have just moved in, I, I think I know about everybody that lives in it, and they probably have known me. So, but through that organization, I think we're doing a lot of good things. I know we're growing, but um, the people, uh, you know, they're very understanding, and so uh, with those uh, kind of things that happen, uh, based on the history of the township. You know, they have to uh, recognize that we are going to grow and we have to be sensitive to that and tolerant, mm -hmm. too. Now, the um, one thing that's nice about Silver Spring Township is that, here, you know, it was part of the frontier. I mean, we have a lot of history here. Anybody that wants to come to this county, they have the, all the history they want. I mean, we have... Uh, frontier history. We have frontier forts. We have Indian history on the on the Susquehanna, or on the Cono de Gwinnett. We have World War II history. We have the the Carlisle Army War Colleges in Carlisle, and we have the depots, the Hessian museums. Um, we also our courthouse has been shelled during the Civil War. We had the Civil War right in our backyard at Gettysburg. So. Uh, the Confederates had made it this far, so there were skirmishes. I mean, we, the courthouse got shelled, so there must have been something going on. So I think the township has a lot for everybody, and anybody that wants an interest in history, you know, this is the place to be, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, the, the Confederates actually went through Silver Springs Township on the way to Harrisburg, correct? Which correct. they ended up going into Camp Hill. Sure, and they also, that's why some of the places you will see Signal Hill, you know, that, that's part of it. In, in Lemoyne, uh, near uh, Washington Heights Elementary School, there was at Mount Washington, which was a fort where the guy, you know, was looking for the Confederates. And the Confederates went out 34. I think there's a marker out there on Route 34 above Carlisle, which is the furthest point north that the Confederates had gotten during the Civil War. And it, it was just a group of, uh, they were scouts and scared off by some local people, said all oh, the big... The Union Army's right around the corner, and they turned around and left without incident. But those are the kind of histories that you talk to some of the residents here and that, that were here uh, that are older people that I got to know in the 70s, and they were older then. And, you know, when I talk to these people, and, you know, you can see the twinkle in their eye about history and telling me about something that maybe they didn't experience, but they were told by somebody, maybe by, another, like they were a young man, like me, that they were told by somebody who lived there on what happened within the area. And, you know, I, I start to think about, you know, what's going through their minds, you know, and, you know, how to ex explain how they look. And, you know, it's like Dumas Malone is an author who wrote a lot about Thomas Jefferson. And, you know, when he talks, or when you read anything, he, it, there's just, like he talked to Thomas Jefferson, and there's no way he did, but these people say, oh, I remember this, and I remember that, and I think when I talk to people, they're always willing to give us information, you know, t you know, hey, you know, my mother was this, and, and, and uh, when I first moved here, uh, you know, I, I guess I just pushed towards there, and I, I stayed on the police department for 12 years, and that's a young man's game. That's mm -hmm. not for an old guy. And so I, uh, my interests have really, in the history of the area, uh, it has, uh, has turned around. And, you know, when I went to college, I was an engineering major. I really didn't want to do that. I wanted to be an English, English literature major. Mm -hmm. And I told my mother, I said, I want to be an English literature major. And she said, that's excellent. That's a great idea. But you're not going there. You're going to be an engineer. <laughs> 
I said, yes, mother. So mm -hmm. it was a tough time. Um, and Silver Spring Township has seen a tough time. The economy was bad in the 70s, early 70s when I came here, and we've just gone through a, a rough time. And, you know, the, I think those times are good because it gives you time to breathe. You know, when we would have meetings about the conservation, I'd say, do we have anything coming new? It gives us an opportunity to, to slow down a little bit, to take a look at things, to make things different. And uh, so that's one of the things I like about the conservation group. And uh, now there's another conservation group which is doing the land for farms. It's an excellent group, and I think that they're doing a wonderful thing on preserving the farms because we have to save them. I mean, they're, like my dad always says, you know, buy land. They're, they're not making any more of it. It's there. You know, you got to buy it while it's available. And so, but I... Uh, I bought the schoolhouse. It was uh, it was the old Simmons schoolhouse, and and it was it was rough at first. But mm -hmm. I have uh, done a lot of work on it. And Did you change it? Were you the one that you? I I, I took the house, reconstructed re it into and modern. Yeah, modernized it so that we could live in it with the family. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it's a very nice property on Sample Bridge Road, and mm -hmm. and uh, so. Uh, it's close to everything, what makes it nice. Mm -hmm. And now we have a new hospital near us, so the traffic gets a little bit more mm -hmm. intense. But um, during the time I, when I didn't live in the schoolhouse, I used to drive out Cumberland Drive, up Cumberland Drive, or, or uh, and past the old uh, uh, Junkin House. Mm -hmm. It was a stone house that was extremely close to the highway, and and I go by it, and I wouldn't think much of it, and. Bud Gaskin came to me one time and he says, you know about the Junkin House? And I said, no, Bud, uh, give me a little insight into what this house is all about. And he explained that Joseph Junkin was one of the people who had come into this area. They were Reformed Presbyterians, Coventers, from over in uh, overseas for religious, um, maybe not religious freedom, but so they take a look. Then we had the Quakers in Philadelphia, but they came over here. And that time they came in was the 1700s, and this was pretty much a wilderness. So New Kingston may not have been there. Hoaxtown might have been just a, a watering hole on the way between the two towns. Maybe a stop for highwaymen, highwaymen that would prey on the business people that would go by. But the Junkins uh, had a big following of religious people, the Coventers, and Reformed Presbyterians. No, you got Presbyterians, you got Reformed Presbyterians. The, don't be confused. I totally don't understand but the difference, but um, they had their own way of thinking. And so, years ago, there was a what they called a tent ceremony, which was the first communion held in the Americas. And it was held in New Kingston. And so, Bud said, that you know, there's some people who want to get together who are owning the Canalga House, and they want to put up a marker, a state marker, a dedication marker from the Historical Society of the State of Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And I said, well, I, you know, I, I could do that. I said I could get together with a steering committee, and so I did myself and Mary Jane Kretzing, who was the owner of, of the Canalga House and uh, also a few other people uh, that wanted to become part of it. And we were going to, the idea was to go ahead and have a marker placed. Well, we found out it wasn't that simple. I mean, there's a lot of little paperwork you have to fill out, and there's a cost. And mm -hmm. so we decided after we had to put it on a year that we would gather the money together, we would uh, get donations, we would contact the Junkin family. And the Junkins, um, we located a few. And we would appreciate if the, you would let, those people would let us know other people. So the time came in 2010. The marker was paid for. We, we got money together. And uh, one of the things that, for this communion, this uh, Reverend Culbertson came over from over at Scotch-Irish, he came mm -hmm. over here to do the ceremony. It was a day-long or a week-long tent ceremony. So we hired people to go ahead and find out exact location. You know, you read books and you read, they say, well, it was 100 feet from the big oak tree and it was left of this. Well, of course, they're not here anymore, so mm -hmm. that, that gives you a difficult situation and GPS certainly wasn't available in those days. But 
what we did was that we found it to be the most accurate position, which is along the Carlisle Pike, and there was the Carlisle Pike has been relocated from New Kingston to the northern side, mm -hmm. and so along there behind behind the church, behind St. Stephen's Lutheran Church, was a spot, and we decided we we're going to have the ceremony, a dedication ceremony in which I, I uh, was able to get uh, some representatives and people to talk and invite the Junkin family. And we would have a, a light breakfast. Well, in thinking that we would get maybe, you know, 20 or 30 Junkins, we ended up with 200. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. <laughs> and it was a great day. And, um, and so we were able to put that marker up. And uh, during that time, uh, I took advantage of the house. I took, uh, the house was sitting there in disrepair and I was afraid that it might be uh, raised or demolished and the, the owners were the trucking company and so I formed a nonprofit organization with a bunch of people called the Cumberland Valley Preservation Society at Silver Spring. With our scope of restoring and maintaining and preserving land and houses within inside Silver Spring or in the Cumberland Valley, predominantly Silver Spring. And so we went into an agreement with the trucking company about uh, uh, we, I have control over the lease agreement and we cleaned it out and we, we're trying to get it to the point where we want to have it restored. The issues that we have with the Junkin house is that the, I've received the money from the Junkins, which we've been able to u utilize to secure it, to keep it from being vandalized, or considered what I say is a blighted property, which it's not. The issue is that the house is so close to the road that the road is uh, becomes it becomes a, a, a you know hard to get in and out of the house. So. We have an ultimate plan for the Junkin House, and that's to have it moved back off the road to a certain area where there was a granary. And so we're gonna try to uh, work with that. Um, so that uh, it costs some money, but the, the trucking company is willing to go with us. So we've been negotiating for years, and as long as I can, I got breathing and we can keep it you know, from being uh, torn down, I'll be happy. I have other people, I have younger people that have become part of the group so that they can and, and help. And one of the things that uh, Bud Gaskin had was an extensive library of history. And I contacted the family and they said, as soon as I move the house and get it restored, I can put the books in there for people to look at. And a lot of his historic memorabilia. And so one of, that's one of the things that's gonna be uh, will be a legacy to Bud. I mean, he's, he's 100 now. He's not going to be around for a long time. But, uh, you know, it's, uh, yeah, I bring these names up, and these are people that have affected my life here. You know, I've lived in this area longer than I lived in Altoona. I've lived here 40-some years. I only lived there for 23 years. Mm -hmm. And so this is my home. It's it's not, uh, Altoona is a it's a great town to be from, you know, and, and but uh, the economy is, is uh it's better here than it is there, mm -hmm. and so. Um, but speaking about the economy, mm -hmm. and this is kind of like turning the page a little bit from that, was um, were you um, in the police force then with Silver Springs whenever there was um, the 81, the, um, the truckers protested on 81? Sure. You want to um, share a little bit about that? Which well, yeah, that's. Uh, I was on the police department when when the, we had what we called the trucker strikes, and and it was a, a lot to have to do with fuel and everything else. And one of the things that Silver Spring Township had was a truck stop, which was roadway truck stop. They also had Heishman's truck stop, and there was a a, a, a lot of gathering of uh, people who were were. They were good people. They just uh, they were they were trying to protest for one thing, and and uh, so you know it was one of those things you know that we got through, and we used to we used to bring a dog in the car for you know because you know there was just a few of us on our department. We only had seven people, mm -hmm. and so it was kind of a massive undertaking. Uh, the main thing we tried to do was ensure that they, nobody got hurt. I mm -hmm. mean there was. 
uh, you can anything from shootings to throwing stuff off of interstate mm -hmm. bridges and stuff and, and, and throwing nails on the road and we've had that and mm -hmm. But all in all, we got through it. It was a difficult time, but uh, we got through it unscathed. And, and I think... Uh, Did the convoy, there was a convoy or something on 81. Yes. And was they, that part of Silver Springs Township? Or yeah. Or was that a little... That, was a, that started in Middlesex because, you know, the Miracle Mile. And, yeah. they, they, and the, the interstate was, uh, is, at that time, uh, the state police handled that Troop S out of Chambersburg okay. and out of Harrisburg. We only assisted on 81, so that okay. was the state police's problem. As a municipal police officer, we, we had enough to handle with our truck stops in, in Middlesex and in Silver Spring, and so this uh, assistance was one of the things. I, I, you know, that was, a, that was a time I think we got through it, and it, mm -hmm. it was just like anything else. You had a job to do, yeah. and you did it. I think most... That was a difficult time, but I think the most difficult time was Three Mile Island. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, Three Mile Island was, uh, I remember the day very clearly. I was sitting at a, a, talking to a gentleman, his name was Jim Fry, and he lived on Silver Spring Road. And he worked at Three Mile Island. And I went over to him, we as a, as a group or as a population, did not understand the ramifications of Three Mile Island. Mm -hmm. When I talked to Jim, I said to Jim, I said, well, they've had a little incident over at Three Mile Island. He said, no, there, he says, there's no little interest, uh, no little incidents. He said, if they had a problem and the water starts going, and we, well, they're gonna be a major problem. And he was right. He was absolutely correct because it wasn't long after that, it started to snowball. People left by droves, and there was little did we know that the, this area, the Harrisburg area, the metropolitan Harrisburg area, there was no evacuation plan. You know, with Chief mm -hmm. Toomey and the people that would get together, the chiefs, there was concern. How are they going to get rid of all these people during if this thing decides to have a real problem with a meltdown? You know. One of the biggest movies at the times was the, the China Syndrome, mm -hmm. if you remember that one. So uh, that was that was kind of a really a difficult time, and you know, but I talked to. In fact, I told my wife to go ahead and go back to Altoona, and uh, the chief. Uh, we all had designated spots in case something happened, and you know, mine was Silver Spring Road in Eleven. Park. I was supposed to be in a pickup truck, you know, mm -hmm. making sure that traffic was leaving. Uh, by that time, there was hardly anybody in the area. So, but uh, that was a difficult time, and, you know, a time, it was a nervous time, but uh, fortunately, we fared out to the best. And so, uh, I think that, uh, you know, it put us on the map, <laughs> put us on the map in kind of a bad way, but. And, you know, everybody, if you ask a lot of people over the country now, Three Mile Island, they'll, they'll know more mm -hmm. about that than they do any nuclear, mm -hmm. uh, other nuclear or power stations mm -hmm. inside the Commonwealth. Mm -hmm. So that was, that was a difficult time. Who were some other people who um, impacted your life with history or just... Well, you? You know, like I say, Betty Sullivan, you know, I would sit and talk to her. And one of the things that uh, she... Uh, was involved with, which was a donation of books for the uh, College for Women. They would get books and they would sell them at sales. And they had a barn, a sample barn, and uh, mm -hmm. it, from uh, Sam Sample. They, they lived in the Sam Sample house. And, and they were restoring it. They restored it, and I think uh, even to this day, there's probably restoration. It takes a long time, but mm -hmm. Betty's long gone now. and. But I would sit and talk to her, and, and she'd come out with a, a, a book, and she said, you ought to read this book. And I says, okay. And, and the book was written by Eric Sloan, and Eric Sloan is an author of Proportions of Americana. He was an itinerant sign painter. His name, uh, he, he's, he passed away too, but... He read a lot of books, and I have probably most of his books, and, and that's what he wrote about. He wrote about our vanishing landscape and how the landscape has changed, how to tell the weather, how to do things in history, uh, to how things, the 
people did it, how the Indians did it. And Betty Solomon was big on that, and we had talked to her greatly. She had probably had the biggest impact, her and Bud Gaskins, because they were close friends and discussed a lot of history, to the point where, you know, being a policeman at that time, it, there, the pay was kind of limited because of the... And so I had to do other things, and one of them was... I, I, did some carpentry work, and I started to get interest in re restoration. And so Betty, I, re I restored a lot of her carriage set and, and, and uh, redid a lot of the architectural details of old wood that they had. Um, and they had a barn full of wood, and I would do a lot of uh, historic restorations to the house and painting and shutter restoring. And so we really would sit down and talk about the, the little details of shutter hinges and dogs. And, and she came to me one time and, and uh, showed me a picture of the old bridge, covered bridge, sample bridge. And I said, well, what was this? And she said, well, Agnes in 72, before I came here, had wiped it out. And I said, well, that's a shame. I said, you know, we, you could have saved some of that. She said, it's in the barn. Uh -huh. There's some of the timbers in the barn that they salvaged, that they could salvage from their property. And so we uh, looked at that, and I took some of the, the wood. And, and, and her husband, Jack, he, he was, uh, like I say, he was an attorney. And I'd go through the barn, and he would have all kinds of moldings. I said, well, where'd you get these? He said, oh, well, they were tearing down some houses over in Harrisburg. And I went over and got, he got the molding and wainscoting and stuff like that. And so Betty would talk a lot, and she come up to the Historical Society and did a lot of things, and museum over to the William Penn Museum over in Harrisburg, and uh, go through that. And I, I enjoy going through there. And so uh, I've collected a lot of things over the years, and my daughters have wanted to know when we're going to downsize. I said, as soon as I'm gone and you have a chance to have a yard sale, that's when it's <laughs> going to be downsized, because I'm not getting rid of anything right yeah. now. So. Mm -hmm. But I have a lot of talents. I'm, like I say, I'm semi-retired. I, mm -hmm. I just can't seem to not work. Mm -hmm. You know, I have a lot of interest, a lot of things to do. I've been to Williamsburg and Monticello, Monticello and, and all the historic sites, as Old Sturbridge Village, Old Bedford Village, all these places where you can get information, you know, just little things. You know, mm -hmm. when Washington Berg was over at the Carlo Army War College, I was over there. And, mm -hmm. And, uh, and I like a lot of history movies, but, uh, you know, I would say that Betty and Bud and uh, Bill Stauffer, I don't, you don't know Bill Stauffer, he was kind of a curmudgeon type of individual, but he was a, he was a, a man that uh, I asked one time, I said, you know, Bill, I said, you know, you, lo you like the history and the revolution and the people of old times and living back there when you didn't have all the convenience. I says, would you like to live back then? Oh, no, he said, no way. He said, there, he said they had diseases back there you don't even want to have. And I said, yeah, I guess you're right. I said, I said, they were stout individuals. He said, yeah, but they didn't live very long. And he says, it's now's the day and time when conveniences are nice. Mm -hmm. And so he, he, he was one that I spent a talk to. And um, it seems like during my police career, I got to know all the older people mm -hmm. of the township and knew Bill Biddle and, you know, and Max Hemp and, and uh, you know, just sat around and talked to these mm -hmm. people because they had a story to tell. Do you want to elaborate a little bit about Max Hemp and, and his, what he means to the township? Max Hemp, you know, was, uh, you know, he, he had the quarries and the construction and he had the big farm down there where he raced horses. and. He had his own veterinarians and that, and, and Max owned a lot of land. Now, Cumberland Valley High School is on land that Max donated. So Max was a philanthropist, and Max gave a lot to the community and a lot to the township. He was a, a, a great guy who, you know, he liked horses. He liked his racehorses. He owned uh, farms up in New York where he studded the horses. And, you know, uh, I would take the kids down and, you know, to see the 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 polo grounds and to see the horses and he was he was very approachable he wasn't somebody that did I could drive up to the house and he would say how you doing I drive up in a police car and talk to him of course I, I guess he thought I was there for other reasons but mm -hmm. but I got to know Max and and uh, 
uh, he was a, a huge man, a gigantic guy, a great guy. And he had farms and cattle, and, and he would do anything for you. And he did a lot for the community and, uh, you know, just the high school. You see it today. It's just um, amazing that that thing has progressed right. to where it's at. He donated the land yes. for that. Yes. And, yeah. And, and, you know, Old White, Walt Bashore and him were friends because Max was on the school authority, too. Mm -hmm. And whenever Max put the uh, highway, you know, they put 81, Max mm -hmm. Hemp, Hemp Brothers, you know, they did the, the highway. And it came through Walt Bashore's farm, you know, in the land. And um, Walt Bashore was kind of a funny guy, you know, and he sat there and he told me, he said, Denny, you see that, you see that road out there? I said, yeah. He said, that's Interstate 81. I said, well, I know that. He says, that went right through my farm. I said, yeah. And he says, and Max Hemp did the work. He says, he was a friend of mine, but he says, you know, he, Max did all the topsoil. He took it off there, off my farm, put it on a pound. And he says, I sold every bit of it. <laughs> <laughs> and so he says, I think Max knew that, but he said, I don't. He says that was one of the things mm -hmm. in getting back at Max. And I, that was just because he took my farm. So mm -hmm. he was a funny kind of guy. Yeah. And yeah. So, but, you know, uh, I, I think one of the things, too, when 81 went in, uh, there was a policeman that I worked with, which was, his name was Paul Walters. And uh, he was killed. He was hit by a car on the Carlisle Pike. And now we dedicated the bridge to him, you know, and I was there. And Paul and I were really good friends. And and one time he told me, when 81 was, it was not open for business, but the concrete was poured. And, and we, when did 81 go in? You want to, do, do you know about when? Oh, that would have been sometime in the late 70s, okay. 77 or somewhere around that period okay. of time, at 78. Well, they, it was all concrete, and Paul and I would go on out there, and, and we would, and he told me one time, he says, you know, Denny, this is going to be an extremely busy road someday. And I said, well, I says, it's going to take a lot of truck traffic. If Paul would see that today, he, he, he would know that he was, he was spot on. He knew mm -hmm. that was going to be that way. And we put the new spur in, you know, the 114. And so I remember 114, I, I have an aerial photograph of that. And there's one out here in the museum, but there wasn't anything around. The only thing that was there was Doc Wade's farm. Right. And now if you look from above, you have everything from Walmart to car lots. To, it's amazing the development that has occurred. Well, that 114 wasn't even really a road. That was all farmland. That The road ran up past McCormick's farm. Well, sure. It came across the old Aaron Bridge over there by... There's a, there's a, um, a stone uh, Iron, Iron, Ma Iron Masters area on Willmill Park Road. And it used to come right out past the old township building. And it would come out there at the old A&W root beer stand. Mm -hmm. It was old A&W. And it was... You got to remember one thing. Even though the Carlisle Pike was the main thoroughfare between, you know, the end of '81 and, and Middlesex to Harrisburg, there wasn't a single light. Mm -hmm. There was no lights. It was uh, it, it, it was treacherous. Mm -hmm. I mean, you couldn't get out off a of feeder road because there wasn't a single light up until Skyport Road, which is in Hampton Township. Mm -hmm. And so the traffic would sail through there. And so it was, uh, you know, every man for himself to get out on that highway. Mm -hmm. And so it just, uh, uh, you, you can't imagine the amount of traffic. That, well, I remember a guy, I talked to a state guy. There was a counter up by the Texaco station, Hoagstown. He said, you know, there's a thousand vehicles an hour go by here. I think if you go out in 81 now, you'd find a, a thousand vehicles go by there in about every 10, 15 minutes. Because it, I came when I drove down here, it was just packed with traffic, mm -hmm. and, it, and so, uh, you know, we're in an area. They say that we're within 10 hours drive of 90 percent of the population mm -hmm. in the United States, and so right. that's why we're in an area where warehousing is, you know, you know, becoming something that it's being proliferated all over mm -hmm. and we've managed to stay away from it for the most part mm -hmm. and we have some but uh, uh, but you know it's uh, there is always uh, I can remember old restaurants like the Pancake Wagon and Paul Carlton's Dutch Covered you know mm -hmm. restaurant and Little Hyde. Mill Park 
I remember the Willow Mill Park because uh, when the children, my kids were in Green Ridge Elementary School, the Ron Rohrabaugh and his wife Cassie had, had the park. And, you know, the 72 flood was kind of rough on the park, but they managed to bring it back. But, uh, you know, this was a time when I think Hershey was starting to have their big stuff. But, mm -hmm. you know, all the kids would go down to the park and, you know, they would ride the little roller coaster and that everybody would have a, this spring fair from the school. And so it was a fun time, you know, and they were opened all summer and... Uh, one of the things we did for the park was when I was on the police department, we fingerprinted little kids and gave the prints to their parents. And, and maybe we were ahead of our time. It was one of the things I decided. I said, why don't we just fingerprint these children, you know, because of incidents. And, and so the other day I was looking through some of the paperwork and paraphernalia. I, have, I found the fingerprints of my two daughters when they were just little. Now well, one's 40 some years old now, but we had fingerprints and I'll, I'll just keep them and then I'll give them to them, maybe to their children, right? their grandkids. And Part so. of what they can go yeah. through. Whenever. That would be their history, you know, yeah. and so everybody has a history, you know, the current days, tomorrow's history. And, uh, you know, I, one time when I, I was on the, I was on the um, PTO, Parent Teachers Organization at Green Ridge Elementary School, and you know I, I helped them. That was when it was just little. You know it, they they were a small school, and the kids went there. They they even went in some side buildings, but they had ref, refurbished the school, and so I was invited back as one of the people who had been there as a uh, as a an organizer of the fair and stuff and. The principal, uh, Bill Pierce, was a principal at Cumberland Valley High School, and uh, I think uh, I uh, he the, he had passed away. I think he had retired, passed away when they did that at uh, Green Ridge. And I went out to Doctor Zanzada, who was out there, and I introduced myself and I said, "You know something, Doctor? I said I moved into this area unbeknowing what the schools were like." And I says, I am so happy that my kids went to Cumberland Valley and got an education. One thing I found in this area, whether it be Cedar Cliff, Mechanicsburg, East Pennsboro, any of the schools, Carlisle, excellent school districts. Coming from Western PA, you know, coming from Altoona, and you know, kind of a little rough area, but uh, I graduated from Altoona during the Vietnam War era. And, um, but I think the schools in this area are fantastic and you know, you know, even though my wife and I had a little difficult time going through it, but we were so happy that the children, our girls, got an education, had two daughters, and and our now our kids, our grandkids are getting educated, and and I, and, and it's great to know that you have. That's one of the things. Education is a big thing, and so uh, one of the things I want to do with the Junkin House when we talk about education. Once we move, and we want to put a a uh, you know like an amphitheater in the back and so that we can bring the school kids in. And, and I might just have somebody come there and make a broom, say this is how they made brooms in the old days, or this is how they used to do this, or, mm -hmm. and you know, just have little seminars. And, and you know, I'm interested in teaching, you know. As you can tell, I'm not afraid to talk to people. Mm -hmm. I've, I, I've talked and, and um, you know, people have a lot to share and then maybe someday somebody will say, yeah, I knew him, he knew all about everything and you know, I knew a little bit about everything. Jack of all trades, but a master of none. You know, that's what they used mm -hmm. to say. But, uh, um, you know, this is, it was great growing up. Uh, it, it's been a uh, tremendous change. Um, you know, if you really think about it, if you watch movies on TV, even t TV shows that might have been made in the 70s when I came here or before that, one thing you don't see is computer screens. Mm -hmm. And you think, now Bud Gaskin's 100 years old, and there's some other people I know that are 100, and, and you know, what have they seen in their lifetime? I mean, there was no computers. There was no calculators. When I first wor worked in the mining industry, we used a slide roll. We didn't, that's, and the, you know, that wasn't that long ago. That was 1970 when I mm -hmm. graduated and went to work in the coal mines. And when I was an engineer, and we did all the design, and so, 
that change is just consistent with the way the change of the landscape in the area. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people just, uh, uh, people come and people go, you know, people die and more people were born. And mm -hmm. it's, uh, you know, you, you, sometimes you think back when I drive over Harrisburg and see the islands, you know, Indians used to live on the islands. They used to live along the side. Jack Sullivan was a, a big, um, interest in Indians that were the Susquehannocks that were here in this area and so um, Jack would always talk about that you know and you know how they you know what how they grew what they did and how they survived and mm. you know was, I, I don't think they was been too happy with this past winter since it was one of the coldest winters but living in a tent but but uh, that that's just uh, what you have to think about if you if a a person can, you know, just sit and think about it and get to, uh, I think, the iPhones and iPads. And the Internet is a great thing. It has a lot of information. It has a lot of good information, a lot of worthless information. But it's it's there. It's out there for the taking. And uh, try to get the kids, you know, more interested in where we came from. Mm -hmm. You know, we know. We don't know where we're going. That's the future. But... We know where we came from, we, and we made mistakes, and we just don't want history to repeat itself in a bad way. But, mm -hmm. uh, but like I said, this area is just a wealth of information on history. All you have to do is go out and look for it. It's there. It's and the people, uh, the people will tell you if you find the right people. Mm -hmm. And so, I know that a lot of the older people are dying off, but. Yeah, there's there's things out there like the historical society here. It's the first time I've been here. I am impressed. Definitely impressed, and and uh, yeah, you know, everybody's time comes sooner or later, you know. And but I've spent all most of my time here just talking to people. I am a. My wife says there. I I would talk to anybody that will sit there and listen to me, and, and I. But yeah, always learn something new every day. You know, I know that's an old cliche, but you know. I tell the kids, you're gonna learn something. I said, I said, you, I said, Pappy, which they call me. I said, you know, Pappy and Grammy, we learn something every day, something we didn't know, and mm -hmm. we're always researching, you know. And so, mm -hmm. my work career, I've always had a job, you know. Like I said, when I was in Altoona working, in a coal, the coal was going down, and jobs were becoming slim, and and so I, that's why I moved. And mm -hmm. my career post uh, post police was, I worked for IBM for a while, and. And the Commonwealth of PA, and I worked as a coroner, you know, for Mike Norris for the county for a while. And, you know, I painted houses, I've cut grass, I've worked in cemeteries, I've done landscaping and built houses. And so uh, I have a lot of talents, mm -hmm. and, you know, so uh, I, I, I'm just sort of. Uh, proud of that I'm from this area you know and mm -hmm. I tell whether you're from and I said well I live in the Carlisle area you know and mm -hmm. we went to Florida last year and a guy we were in Florida for a month you know get away from the coal when I retired and a guy come up and says you're from Pennsylvania I said yeah I said but I said we're from we're from around Mechanicsburg if you know where that is. he says yeah I'm from Carlisle oh. so you'll meet somebody so, everywhere. and then we had a nice discussion and talked and so a lot of the things. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, Denny, thank you very much. And um, it's March 9th, 2015, and this was interview is with um, Denny Herzig, H-R-Z-I-C. That's correct. Okay, thank you very much, Denny. And thank you. I really appreciate it and telling the story. Good. I really love the area. Thank you.